So let's get this party started. My name is Rene, which is also my handle on GitHub and Twitter, or like Justin Schneck would say, the Twitter. You might probably know my project Credo, which is a code analysis tool for Elixir that tries to give guidance and human-friendly results to the user. But this talk is not about Credo. It is about how Jose inspired a site where people can post their Elixir creations. It is about Elixir status. To tell you the story, I have to take you way back to when I created Inch, a tool which, in, which analyzes inline code documentation, although that's not really important. What's important is that this was my first Ruby project with a real purpose, and I really wanted to promote it. I wanted people to see and use it. And I discovered the right place, Ruby Flow, which is a Ruby community site where people can post stuff they made. This is a cool thing in and of itself, but I noticed that a certain Jose Valim was posting to the site about inherited resources, a project of his. And I thought, holy cow, do you, mean, do you realize what that means in terms of visibility? Somebody accomplished like Jose will post an update saying, look, here's an update to something I made. And right below that, in the same space, a complete wanky newcomer like myself could post, ha ha, and here is something that I did. This really impressed me. So a year later, when I had created my first hex package, some volunteers and I created this site. It's called elixirstatus.com. It lets you post your project updates, announcements, blog posts, books you've written, and meetups you've started. You can do so by signing in via GitHub and posting simple announcements in Markdown. And the twist is only the creators of stuff are supposed to post their own stuff. If we take a closer look at the site, we can see why. There are all kinds of postings, an announcement for a Kafka-related project, and below that, a blog post about Phoenix integration testing. The reason why we only want the actual creators to post their stuff, instead of letting everyone um, post what they found on the interwebs, is simple. When the person, whoops, when the person posting a project or blog post is the actual creator, it makes sense to link his or her GitHub profile. It also makes sense to optionally let them link their Twitter profile, because in the past, this had le has led to interesting discussions in the Twitterverse about the posted thing. And finally, it is that easy to retweet stuff you like. Now, this has become a great tool, and real people are using it. And you can subscribe to all these updates via the social channel you prefer, so you don't necessarily have to visit the website every couple of days. This is because I thought of Elixir status as a social tool. It was meant to be infrastructure for all of us. Chris mentioned what a young community we are. And because we are such a young community, it is important to give our open source projects all the visibility we can. And another important thing here is lowering entry barriers and welcoming newcomers to this community. The latest of these channels you can subscribe to is Elixir Weekly, which is a weekly email newsletter about all things, all things Elixir. It is, in a way, my personal take on the community, including all the stuff that's posted to Elixir status. I'd like to close with a very special thanks to Johnny Wynn. He created the MyElixir status hashtag on Twitter, which many of you will know, and which obviously inspired the name for elixirstatus.com. He has always been someone who inspired me. Hello. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Pete Gamash. I work for a company called AppQs in Boston. I write Elixir a lot. We run it in production. And uh, I'm going to tell you about a library, a very small library, that I wrote to make my life simpler. It is called Gen Retry. As you can probably tell from the title, it's a generic retry. Um, it provides retry with exponential back off, configurable, configure your delay, configure your exponential base, um, a whole bunch of stuff. All you need is a function that will raise an exception when it fails and won't when it works. 
it's real easy. I encourage you to check out the code on GitHub. It's a real quick read. So um, I'm talking about me. Now you, everything works. Everything works the first time, every time. I can, I can really only imagine what that's like. Uh, and so uh, I need tools to help me along. Uh, on a more serious note, your code is not that great either. Um, and a lot of it, I'm going to put the blame squarely on other people. I mean, like, you connect to a network service. Maybe it's there. Maybe it's not. Is it written in Elixir? I'm not sure. Uh, so you're going to have to retry things. Um, the, the let it crash mantra is great, but sometimes you don't want, like, you don't necessarily want to set up a supervision tree for a really small thing. You don't want various parts of your system coming down earlier than you want them to. Uh, so uh, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Uh, quick note on exponential back off. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with it. What it means is that in between retries, you, so you try something, it screws up. You do not immediately retry. You wait a little bit of time, let's say one second. If it screws up again, you wait two seconds, and then four, and then eight. Now that's an exponent of two, but essentially the idea is that every time you need to retry, you back off even a little bit more. Um, I'll talk just a little bit about jitter. Jitter is a way of adding a degree of randomness to when something is retried. So for instance, a jitter of 0.5 or 50% on a delay of one second would mean you would wait between one and one and a half seconds randomly selected. And this is useful if, for instance, you have 500 servers all hitting the same external service. The ex external service is down for a moment, uh, and then everything waits 10 seconds and just hammers it again. You don't want that. Doesn't work as well. Uh, so the basics. Um, there are two main functions in GenRetry. Uh, one is just called GenRetry.Retry. It handles background processes where you don't really care about the output value and doing something with it. Um, so it's you know considered a replacement for spawn link. Uh, and then we have GenRetry task async. And that is a drop-in replacement for task async, except it provides retries. Uh, and if at the end, you know, you go through the specified number of retries, it blows up in exactly the same way that task async would. So you have this, this background process. Uh, we don't care about the output value. We just want to know that the TPS reports have been delivered. Um, a lot of people care about that. But it, wh what happens if this screws up? I'm feeling sad and scared already. But with just one extra line of code, uh, we are able to say, hey, just do this a bunch of times. You know, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. But if it works out of one of those five times, then that's one larger crash that your service does not have to take care of. Nope. Uh, uh, spoiler, this is what happens in the next frame. Uh, OK, so task async. This is when you care about the return value for something. Uh, other languages would call this pattern futures or promises. The idea is that you can start a bunch of asynchronous tasks to go do stuff and then sit there and collect all the results at the end. Um, but again, what happens if it doesn't work? Yeah. Uh, so here is a simple example of how to use GenRetry task async, and it's pretty much the same thing. Drop in replacement, specify how many retries, how long you want your initial delay to be, and uh, it, Bob's your uncle, pretty much works. Uh, in conclusion, Real short talk. I mean, there are no small speaking engagements, just small speakers. Uh, let it crash, but on your terms. You get to decide what part of your program falls down, how big that part of the program is, uh, and GenRetry is a tool for helping you out with that. Um, we have a few other open source tools. Xconstructor is good for structs. Uh, Stifle will trap return values, or sorry, non-return values, side effects, and then release them. And uh, other than that, see you in the pool. Right, so I had to do something in Elixir, uh, just very simple task. I had to, wait, can you hear me now? Right, so my name is Fahim, I work for Deliveroo. I had, I started learning Elixir uh, about a year ago. Uh, just small task, I did some small things. Uh, so one of the things that I did was uh, I had to, I had the remote API that I had to query and get a number of uh, requests and it was about half a million data points that I needed to get. 
and the remote API was, it was not uh, very performant, so I had to uh, scale it down. The number of concurrent processes that I can ask it to do was limited. So, but I didn't know what that limit was, so I needed to have concurrent processes, but how many or what it was, I would have to figure out. So first, I needed a background processes. The second was that I wouldn't want to overwhelm the remote API. So for that, I wrote something that, like, coming from Rails, is a, like a rescue worker, is some jobs that, is, that needs to run in parallel. So for that, I used uh, Poolboy. So to use Poolboy, I, uh, there's a simple way to, like, I would show it like how I used a Poolboy. So for using a Poolboy, you have a number of workers in the Poolboy that it manages. You can ask it for a single process from it, a worker from it. You ask that worker to do some job. Once that job is done, you check back, check that worker back in. So what I was doing was I had a number of rows that the data that I needed to post to this API. That API does some calculation, it would give me back some results. So uh, I would get that row, I would send it to the service, service will calculate something, and I would get result, I would put it in database, and that was the task. So uh, I ran a pool boy, pool boy with 10, 10 workers in the start. So those 10 workers, I would give them job immediately. So 10 jobs at a time, the 11 job, my process would stop. My process will wait because it's trying to transaction to get the transaction, get that worker. So to get that worker, it will wait until one of those 10 got free, checked back in, and uh, I could get hold of that worker. So this is the code I wrote. This is simple. Just th the point of this talk is just to show how simple it is to do background processes. So if you look at this method, send to pool, that's all we need to do to actually run background processes. Uh, you run a transaction, you tell what your pool, what your gen server's name is, the pool gen server, and I will show like how that is set up. But the second is a anonymous uh, function that takes in a PID that where you send what to do. And that's it. That's all you need to do to actually make it work. So for, actually setting up the pool, I would show like it's how simple that is. It's just you have to have a pool name. You have to have a uh, what workers you want to use for it, how, ma how many workers you want to use for one, and how much overflow, like how many extra workers, if there is a rush, there is a peak, and you want to solve that, how many extra workers you want. And th that's all that's needed. Thank you. <laughs> All right, hi, my name's uh, Rockwell Schrock. Um, just uh, pretty much a newbie to Phoenix and Elixir. I don't know about you guys, but uh, this is me at the past couple weeks, learning all this cool stuff. Um, this is an authorization, uh, I almost said gem, authorization package that I extracted uh, from an application that I'm working on. It's called Authy. Um, it's very similar to Pundit in the Ruby world, if you're familiar with that. Um, the way it works is you define a policy module that basically just um, has, it's not quite a, um, it has a certain convention that you follow. So if you have a post, or in Phoenix it's going to be myapp.post, then you have a post.policy module that it expects to look for for authorizing actions. Um, cool thing that this has, that uh, Elixir has over Ruby is normally in Pundit, you, uh, the action that you're authorizing is the name of the method itself. Here, you can just use pattern matching to do the authorization, so much so that you don't even really need anything in the body of your function in a lot of the cases. So for here example, admin user can do anything. Um, a certain user can only modify a post if they own it, right, if the post user ID is equal to the user ID. Um, and then there's also, you can do like a catch-all, so deny all actions for everyone else if they're not authorized. This has a cool side effect um, in that if you forget to define, cover a certain case in your policy module, it just throws an error, and you know that you've missed a certain case. Here's a quick example of how it looks. Um, just, for example, show a bunch of users, admin, and post, and it just 
shows you the different ways in which you can call it using this uh, authorized method. All it's doing is just really simple. Um, it just follows the convention, so it knows that admin is a struct type user. It looks for user.policy, and it just calls the you know, can method on that function. You can also handle the case of a nil user. For example, a guest user is not logged in. Uh, you can handle that in your policies as well through pattern matching. And if you don't have a particular instance of a resource, you can just pass the module name itself, for example, for an index action. Another idea I stole from Pundit is policy uh, scopes. So certain users might only have access to index or list certain resources. Uh, here I'm using Ecto, but it doesn't have to be. There's no dependency on Ecto. You can uh, just use a scope to figure out, again, which user can access which things for a certain uh, operation. Again, here, admin can see all posts. User can see only posts where they, that they've owned. And uh, maybe a guest user can only see posts that are published. So all that stuff is not at all specific to Phoenix. I've also included a Authy controller module that you can include in all of your controllers that has a couple of macros to um, sort of help and reduce some typing. So in your index action, well here we've already imported Authy controller in the WebEx file, so it's in all your controls already. There's an authorized macro here, which you can pass the resource that you're authenticating, or authorizing. And then if it succeeds, you do the block. And if it fails, you can define any number of actions uh, through a callback module that you defined in your config. Here we're authorizing the post for an index and then uh, scoping it depending on the user. You can also use scoping uh, for when you're retrieving a particular thing. The scope is designed to sort of start building your queryable so that when you pass it to the repo for retrieving it, um, you know that it's within the right context. Like I mentioned, you can customize how um, failures are handled. For example, you might want to uh, handle when a resource is not found or whether it's unauthorized, and you can change um, depending on you know, how important your resource is. Uh, you might not want to reveal that something's not found. You might just want to say it's unauthorized, depending on the user's uh, permissions. And all those defaults that, are, that that macro kind of assumes about your controller, you can override for any sort of weird edge cases. You can change which policy module it's looking for by default. You can change the action, and um, so on and so forth. There's a couple of recommendations in here for sort of how to structure it. Um, one of the cool things I th thought about is maybe you have a controller that's not particularly like a RESTful controller. There's no real resource behind it. Uh, you can just define a policy for that controller. And um, you just pass it, and that way you can authorize actions on that controller. Looks like my time's almost up, so um, three, two, one. Thanks, guys. OK, so this is a story of what's happening in production over like the last month in our Elixir app. We have a mix of Ruby and Elixir apps, um, and they're very similarly structured. They have to talk to each other over RabbitMQ. We use the RPC pattern, so we have clients and servers on both sides. Uh, but we were getting uh, memory leaks. The Elixir app, after a little while, depending on how much traffic we got, would just run on memory and crash. We'd see the, we had memory monitors from our hosting provider, and it would be a nice little ramp. Every request, memory got bigger and bigger. And that's because process leaks can equal memory leaks. Uh, so we would, in our Phoenix controllers, we would start a gen server with start link. Uh, that Phoenix controller process would exit, and the gen server would keep running. It, uh, Took us a while to figure that out, though, because our hosting provider didn't allow us to run observers, and I kind of hacked around that. And then I figured it out. Uh, and the reason for this is that a Phoenix controller exits as a normal exit, and normal exits aren't caught by gen server when you do start link. What you have to do to get that is to trap exits, which is process flag trap exit true. Uh, if I'd actually read the docs really carefully and understood the exact wording, it actually says as much in the docs for gen server start link. Uh, another problem we were having is that our RabbitMQ kept crashing with too many queues, which I didn't even know was possible. Like it's able to just, there's too many queue names and it'll do, go down. Um, so we thought we were being safe because we followed the docs and we use auto delete and exclusive. Um, for, we use AMQP queue declare in Elixir and we use uh, the bunny gem in Ruby. 
They both say they're exclusive, they both say auto-delete, but we get different behavior. Because in Ruby, the client creates the connection, the client creates a channel on that connection, and when the client is destroyed just through normal garbage collection of Ruby, the connection gets destroyed. Meanwhile, in Elixir, because I wanted to be responsible, I actually read the RabbitMQ docs, and it said you should pull the connection. So I put the connection in a gen server, and then anyone can just ask for that connection, so I don't create a new TCP connection to the uh, Rabbit server all the time. The client creates a channel on that connection, and then the client's destroyed. The, the bug is already fixed, so the client really does clean up. But exclusive doesn't delete the queue until your connection is lost. We only lose the connection in Elixir if Rabbit actually restarts. So exclusive won't do cleanup for you if you're keeping your connections open to RabbitMQ. And auto-delete doesn't delete your queue until your channel closes. And it turns out, even with the trap exits and terminate, unless we explicitly close the channel, auto-delete won't clean up the queue either. So even though both those options are documented as, oh, this is how you make sure all your stuff is cleaned up in Rabbit, you have to very explicitly clean up after yourself. And there's also a gotcha on auto-delete of that the automatic delete won't happen if no one ever uses the queue. So if you time out and you don't get a response and no one's used the queue, that can also lead to it not being cleaned up. Yep, that's it. So has anybody ever heard of Ratchet? Mom, mom, put your hand down back there. No, 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 you don't count. Yeah, so Ratchet's this idea that I'm playing with. Um, it's sort of this thing, so I feel like there's room between the traditional server rendered apps and then these really complicated thick client applications. And don't get me wrong, uh, all these front-end frameworks are really, really awesome. They do a really great job for what they're great at, and that is they're great for building applications, right? Um, this is things like the Atom uh, text editor and the Cloud9 in-browser text editor, things like that. But, web page, but that's a lot of complexity. Uh, it, when we do that, we have to maintain two separate applications. We have our back-end application and our front-end application, and they're talking to each other, and that's really hard. That's a lot of complexity for simple web pages. Um, really, web pages are often just documents. These are things like Amazon and uh, your, your marketing website for your company. That's just simple documents. So to introduce the complexity of a server, uh, server or client uh, JavaScript application, it may be a little much. I saw a talk recently by uh, Stan, uh, <laughs> Sam, Sam Stevenson at RailsConf uh, this past few months, and he was talking about TurboLinks, and he, he presented this information I thought was pretty good, how in the past 12 years, uh, the complexity of applications has really, really grown. Uh, it was really simple when Rails first started, and now we've got all this JavaScript happening both on the server and the client, um, and it adds a lot of complexity. I would encourage you to go watch this talk because it's super, super interesting. Um, but you might be thinking, if we go back to the simple thing, we're going to be missing something really great about new applications, and that is, we want to be able to see live data updates as the state changes on the server, right? And so if we go back to this model of you know, the model view controller and the request response cycle, there's really no way for the, the client to, go, to be uh, aware of state changes on the server. So that's where this tool ratchet comes in. So it's kind of this, this little thing that you bolt onto uh, that traditional view, and it, it's a data stream that uh, communicates, the client communicates with the server, and hopefully it's really simple to use. Uh, let me warn you, I, I don't really know what it is yet. I've been playing with some tools, and I've got some things built, but I would say they're not even, like, close to ready. Um, but as a high-level kind of overview, what the idea is, is you'll describe the page content as a data structure, and then use that data structure to uh, represent, to, to build the view. So it comes in two parts. Uh, one part's on the server. This is a templating language. So you might have templates that look like this in your application. This is EEX. So you've embedded some Elixir code in your view. Um, I'm thinking maybe we could do something like this, where we have annotations that we add to our view. Our views are plain HTML. One benefit of this is it's really, really friendly to our designers. They can deliver prototypes to us in plain HTML, and those prototypes become the literal templates that we use uh, to power our application. And then we prepare a big data structure like this and present it to the view, and the view reacts by adding that data uh, to itself. So the second part is a client, and this is a hopefully zero configuration thing. Uh, it might look like this. Uh, the, the gist of it is I don't really want to write JavaScript. I want to just require a library, and it just works. So let me show you a quick demo. I recorded it so I wouldn't mess it up. All right, so the first thing that I do is add, uh-oh, you can't see it. Full screen, go! 
Yeah, so the first thing that I do is add uh, this socket. You can see at the top, I'm going to hit play so you can see it keep going. The next thing that I do is uh, create or add a, a JavaScript dependency. That's the, the library code, the client code. And then uh, reference it within, uh, within my application. Is this going at 2x? There we go. All right. So then I add to my uh, JavaScript app document that single line of code to require the library. Uh, and then within uh, this model, for lack of a better term right now, uh, we have this module that creates a thing called an action. And an action is like a way of mutating state on the server that is aware of the clients. It actually broadcasts the changes that are made to the client. So it knows that when you create a message, I should tell everyone that, uh, what the messages look like now. And then uh, in our controller or wherever you actually do the creation of that model, instead of using the add thing directly, we use the create action. And then finally, the last thing that, do, that happened is the view is updated uh, with, uh, with the, an annotation that turns it on. So let me show you this thing working real quick, and we'll be done. Hopefully, I have it just a second. I wasn't planning on the, this thing. OK, here we go. So I say hi here, and you see that happen. I open up a new window, kind of move it to the side, and say, Hello, and you see they open and they update themselves live from both sides of the thing. Cool, yay, thank you. All right, so super speed. So uh, first things first, I'm doing a workshop on Elm in the Osprey Ballroom right after the lightning talk. So if you wanna learn some Elm, get over there. We're gonna build cool things together. Um, so let me go through a talk as fast as I possibly can in super condensed form. So I want you to build software better. This is what you spend your life doing and we all die eventually, so that sucks. Um, software is the biggest lever the world's ever seen in terms of making like change in the world. Uh, so, like, the best thing to do would be to, like, make the lever longer, right? And so that's, like, what the computer scientists do. But it's kind of irrelevant because basically everybody in industry is kind of sitting as close to the fulcrum as they possibly can, like, pushing as hard as they can. And when they want to make more change happen, they just bring on more people, push harder. So, uh, yeah, anyway, the best thing is to move further down. So um, we can help people move further down. And, like, functional programming is one of those things. We've known it was better for 50 years, and people still suck and don't use it. Um, Anyway, so I think it's important because it's math that I did for myself a few weeks back. So uh, if you want to be like a successful company, typically you have like a business model and it depends on having like a lot of customers, unless you're the Wu-Tang Clan. So let's assume that you're working on really successful software and do some math. Uh, you have 10 million users, kick ass, awesome, sorry. sorry. Uh, to get the value out of your software, they need, they need to visit an average of like 10 pages a day. And uh, you built the software really badly because you're not good. So each page load takes on average six seconds. But that's OK. Like, nobody does this. We don't have to deal with this like all the freaking time everywhere we are. Like when you're in the biggest hosting platform for developers ever, that's not a thing that's wasting our time. All right, so who cares, though? Like 10 million minutes a day is actually what that is. Um, so that's not an easy number to wrap our head around. It's like millions. What's that? So uh, that's 166,000 hours a day or 6,900 days a day or 19 years a day, which these are all weird metrics. It's a lot of time to stare at a loading screen, but who cares? Unrelated note. People live eight years. Congratulations, your software kills a human every four days. <laughs> so uh, it's software also, so it never sleeps in its bloodlust. So I kind of want to propose that our metrics dashboard should track a mortality rate right alongside the other metrics, because uh, I think it's kind of important. But like, why do I bring all this up? So I think you have an obligation to do your job well, because you're killing people. Um, <laughs> yeah. So enough about murder. Let's talk about computer science. Uh, this is John Backus. If you don't recognize the name, you'll recognize a couple things he's known for. One of those is Fortran. Uh, in 1953, he worked for IBM. He convinced his superiors to let him build a language that made it easier to work with equations and like stop coding assembly directly. And so it's an imperative language, super duper imperative. It's been developed ever since 1953, so maybe the longest lived like extant language people are using. Uh, it also supports parallelism and object oriented programming these days, which is just fantastic to me. Um, so here's an example of Fortran. Uh, super duper imperative, and when I say imperative, I always mean like recipe style. So do A, do B, do C. Cool, stuff happened that we wanted, but there's no way for the computer to know what we wanted, right? It's essentially just a thin shim on top of assembly, just like C is. All right, he also invented what's known as the Bacchus normal form or Bacchus Nauer form, and it's a means of defining the rules of a context-free grammar. So like every programming language that you know is some, probably has a BNF definition, right? So here's JSON. Uh, if you read RFCs, you're gonna see BNF all the time. My point in mentioning all this is he kind of, uh, he's responsible for both one of the longest lived programming languages and the means by which people develop programming languages. So he's kind of an expert on this stuff. And I know like appeals to authority suck, but that's what I'm doing. Um, anyway, uh, BNF won him the Turing Award, so he actually presented this talk, Can Programming Be liberated, liberated from the Von Neumann Style? Um, so 
like what's the von Neumann style? There's this guy, Alan Turing, right? In 1936, he came up with the universal Turing machine, so it's the foundation model that all of our computers work on, and it consists of an infinite tape, a read-write head, all this stuff you might have heard of before. The only thing that sucks about this is that you can't actually build one because we don't have enough infinite tapes. So this guy came in, and in 1945, he described the machine that they built to do some math for some reason, and the machine was an actually constructible realization of the Turing machine. And so it's basically exactly the same thing that you have on your lap right now. This is how it works. You have your CPU, some memory, a bus between them. Neat. Let's come back to Bacchus. So here's some code. This is Algol. Who cares? Uh, it is uh, basically, th this is uh, like in, um, inner product. So that's, that's all right. This is an imperative form of inner product. He found some things he didn't like about this. So uh, there's like invisible state, A, B, and N. It's not hierarchical. It's dynamic and repetitive. Uh, and it, com it, it does some other things that he hates. Here's the thing it does. So it goes over that bus constantly to get memory. So that's what happens when you assign something. And so this is actually really slow. And so you might have heard of the von Neumann bottleneck. But he wasn't actually talking only about this. He was talking about also in your brain there's a bottleneck because you're having to do all this mental computation to remember, oh, what's where, bookkeeping. And so he said this sucks, and it's kind of ruining everything. He said this would be better. This is functional programming. We're just combining or uh, you know, collecting three functions together. And uh, yeah, that's nice. So nice thing. There's no assignment. Everything's composable by default. They're functions. And you can do algebra on programs, and that's super good. So if you, if you like functional programming, do more of that in Elixir. Also try on. Come over there. I'll show it to you. I'll show you why it's neat. Thanks. All right. My slide notes are not on there. So, All right. Let me tell you a story. Uh, my name is Ian Warshak, and I am a developer. I've been doing Rails development for the past 10 years and Elixir development for the past year or so. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about me. Uh, and I say this not to scare you guys, to, but to prepare you guys, because I'm like all of you. This was me four years ago. I got a uh, strep throat, which turned into pneumonia, which turned into septic shock, which turned into multi-organ failure. And I ended up in the ICU uh, in a coma for nine days and ended up in the hospital for over uh, weeks and months. And as part of that, I lost blood flow to my fingers and my feet. And if you can't see me, my hands, my fingers are missing. And if you haven't seen my legs, I have two prosthetic legs. This is my family. This is my music playing next door. <laughs> this is awesome. Uh, so when I woke up, one of, the, one of the first things I thought was, how am I going to teach my kids how to play baseball? How am I going to teach them how to play basketball? How am I going to drive? But how am I going to work without fingers? How does a programmer work without fingers? Um, and honestly, it was kind of a crisis in my head. I didn't know what I was going to do. Lesson one for all of you. Have a uh, this is easier uh, said than done, but I would encourage you all to think about what if you couldn't do what you're doing right now, what would you do? What do you have a passion for? I have a passion for programming, so even with black, dead, necrotic fingers, uh, my friends helped me figure out how to hook up a stylus to my, wrist, to my wrist guard, and within a few weeks I was poking at that on my computer, and I actually started uh, programming while I was in rehab, or continued to program while I was in rehab. Lesson two is have a support system, family, friends, uh, people that are going to lift you up. While I was in the hospital, I had a lot of support. I brought you back in the premiere next door. Okay, all right, let's keep going. Lesson three, get disability and life insurance. It is important and it is cheap. Get term life insurance, get disability insurance, all of y'all. I cannot encourage that enough. How do I work? People ask me this all the time. How do you program without fingers? And that's a very fair question. I wondered the same thing when I was in the hospital, and they told me they were going to have to amputate all my fingers. Well, the answer is practice. Um, I've used some, a few uh, adaptive tools like Dragon that doesn't really work very well for programming. So now I type kind of at the hunt and peck speed that you see you know, your grandpa probably doing. Um, but I found that for programming, it doesn't take as much typing as I first thought it did. I type a little bit, I think a lot, I read a lot of documentation, and then I type a little bit more. So I feel as if I'm just as productive as I was before. Since then, I've been able to do some things that I never even did when I had feet, which is me running a half marathon and, of course, kissing my bicep while I'm doing it. Uh, this year, I also hiked uh, Mount Kilimanjaro, which is the highest mountain in Africa. And it is the, light, the tallest mountain in Africa, and it's 19,000 feet. So again, that's something I never considered doing before. And, and lastly, uh, I represented the US in the 2016 Rio Olympics doing synchronized swimming. Um, so guys and gals, you never know what you can do. So uh, challenge yourself. That's all I have. Thank you.
Okay, uh, hi, I'm Casey. I work at a company called Netflix. For those of you who aren't familiar, uh, Netflix is kind of like Pokemon Go, except instead of hunting Pokemons one at a time, we give you all of them at once. And instead of Pokemons, they're movies. And instead of leaving your house, you can just kind of sit on your couch. But the reason I make the comparison is because like Pokemon Go, Netflix is really popular. Uh, so popular that we're about, we're over a third of the bits on the internet at peak, which by our calculations is a lot. Um, which means that uh, we, we, have, we ran into some scale problems that a lot of other companies hadn't yet run into. Uh, one of those, our control plane being deployed on the cloud, is that uh, we have so many servers at any given point in time, uh, we always have servers disappearing. It's a, a feature of the cloud, if you will. And uh, when those servers disappear, uh, you know, it's usually at 3 a.m. If it happened to be an important uh, uh, server that disappeared, uh, then we get paged and we'd be annoyed that it was so early in the morning. So we created something called Chaos Monkey, which uh, turns servers off in production, but does, it doing, does that during business hours. And uh, this was great because without going out and giving our engineers an edict, like you have to make your system fault tolerant, this created very strong alignment for them all to solve that problem. We took the pain of being on the cloud and brought it forward, and the engineers solved the problem by themselves. And so for the past four-ish years that this has been running in production, we don't run into the problem of our service being disrupted by uh, nodes disappearing, servers uh, crashing. So this was really useful, and it's very fun to put on your professional biography that you break shit in production. Uh, but we thought, you know, there's got to be more to this than that. Um, how do we take this practice and apply it to other things? So we formalized it in what we call chaos engineering. You can go to principlesofchaos.org uh, to read the full description. Basically, chaos engineering is a practice where you take a distributed system, like a microservice architecture, and you're not trying to create chaos. Uh, what, you're, what you're doing is the system, you're assuming that the system is already chaotic, and chaos engineering is a process of, su of surfacing systemic uh, behavior so that you're aware of it, and if it's bad, you can fix it. So, for example, uh, you know, server disappears, service goes down, you'd want to know that, um, and that can be very hard to model. Uh, small change in a microservice over here could have a huge impact on the behavior of a microservice over here. You want to be able to surface that. Chaos engineering lists some best practices uh, at scale of how you set up experiments to run continuously to find those kinds of problems. Uh, we thought this was cool, so did some other people. So I organized Chaos Community Day last year, held it at Uber's office in San Francisco. Uh, Uber, Google, Microsoft, Yahoo, LinkedIn, Facebook, Dropbox, the usual suspects came, and we all discussed best practices. Uh, that was cool, so we did it again this year, uh, Chaos Community Day. We just had it last week in Seattle at Amazon's office. Uh, again, the usual suspects show up, as well as some startups, and so we're starting to see that chaos engineering is an emerging discipline within software engineering, um, which is great. So if you have an interest in this, go to principlesofchaos.org, we have a Google group, uh, or, you know, come heckle me. Thanks. Hi. Uh, so, my name is Przemek, and today I would like to show you a little project that I'm working on. And basically, what it is about. Uh, it's a little browser-based game, a multiplayer game uh, that heavily relies on real-time elements. And to make it, I'm using uh, Elixir together with Elm. And uh, I'm really looking for some feedback uh, because it's a big learning experience for me, especially when it comes to Elm, uh, since there's a lot of very new concepts uh, for me in there. And to start, like, some of my background, the background of the project, uh, I actually spent most of my working years uh, running a browser-based game. It was mainly a text and image thing, and it was my full-time job since uh, 2007, but I wrote it, like, even before that. Uh, and initially, I wrote it in PHP, and it was not 
uh, a good choice. I started accumulating technical debt really quickly, uh, and after many years, uh, many years too late, I decided to switch to Rails. But that was also a problem for me straight away, because uh, I straight away ran into scaling problems. I had a lot of users already, a lot of like different assets, uh, a lot of different components in there, and it became clear to me that I would have to spend a lot, a lot of money uh, to even get it working in the same way as the PHP project was working. Uh, so in 2016, I decided to take a little break and uh, dedicate some time uh, to learning and uh, maybe figuring out how I can get this project off the ground again. Uh, so just to show you how it used to look like, uh, you can see a few screenshots from the game. As I mentioned, it's mostly like images, text, and pure HTML. And another thing I want to mention is uh, we used to host uh, this like, special thing, an April Fool's event that happened almost every uh, April 1st. And during that time, I usually published a really small like, project that was really crazy, really silly. And it, for me, it was a way to uh, test new ideas and new technologies. And just to give you some, an idea what was that, what that was about, one of those projects was a game when you had your own like pet rock and you send it on a, some crazy adventure, like flying balloons and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, so the current game is also in the, I'd say, in the same vein. It's completely silly, completely cartoonish, uh, but this allows me to try different concepts, do really crazy stuff, and when random things happen, I can incorporate them into the game. Uh, you can see some crazy music next door, it kind of like fits, fits into like the, this climate and uh, this atmosphere. Uh, so yeah, just to do it quickly, uh, taking concepts that I'm using, I'm using, of course, Elixir and Phoenix, I'm using Umbrella apps, and Phoenix is just basically a web front, and all the other moving parts are in separate uh, umbrellas. And I'm using Elm, as I mentioned, I'm communicating heavily with Elixir channels and uh, handling all the complex uh, front-end stuff in Elm, but at the same time I'm using jQuery for just some simple things, uh, maybe some animations, stuff like that. And my current idea is to release everything as soon as possible and then uh, send an email or a Facebook message to existing to the players from my previous games. Uh, like, even on Facebook I have around like uh, 9,000 people. Uh, so I really want to invite them and see how everything works. Like, buy a really cheap hosting, uh, run the app there and see how it looks in, actually, in real life. And yeah, I just want to mention about a few things that I already learned during this conference, uh, because I had some, for example, uh, issues with releases when I was experimenting with them, and it looks like distillery handles uh, those things really well. And at the same time, I had some, uh, maybe not problems, but some like, different ideas about how to structure my app, and it looks like a new uh, version of Phoenix uh, takes care of some of that. And yeah, that's it. At the link at the top, uh, you can uh, get the uh, link to my GitHub repo of the game and open source there. And Saint Squid is my handle on Twitter. Thank you. Hey guys, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Fernand Galliana. I'm a kite surfer on Twitter. Uh, how many people here are really doing Elixir, Phoenix, what you've learned today, the presentations, the keynotes, uh, the conference organizers? Well, make some noise. We're getting kicked ass here. Come on. Yeah. Woohoo. Excellent. Excellent. Cool deal. All right. So uh, let's talk about Go. <laughs> If you don't live on the edge, you're taking way too much room, right? So let's talk about that. So I think the, um, you know, the community is great, and I'm sure you know, most of you have run into issues when you come to develop a vehicle application, and then you get to the point where you need to deploy it, and that's where the story kind of gets a little bleak, right? Uh, to me, you know, uh, having to reach out and uh, either use like Capistrano or Bash, uh, you know, seems feels a little bit Jurassic, you know, when it comes to deployment, especially in 2016. So, uh, I'd like to introduce the new concept. It's called uh, mob preserving. 
Uh, the camp is like that, so uh, you know, if you want to kick me off the stage, you certainly can. But really, I want to talk about uh, Kubernetes, uh, which is uh, you know, an orchestration framework that was developed by Google for many years to manage and orchestrate you know, thousands of servers in the, in the cloud. And uh, you know, I've spent a lot of time with Kubernetes and playing with it, and uh, this is something that I think we should or could leverage uh, to deploy our Elixir and Phoenix applications. So uh, let's go through this really quick. Uh, of course, I don't have that much time, but uh, you can think of it as you have a pool of servers and instances, and Kubernetes kind of manage and orchestrates those instances for you. Uh, basically, you can deploy what's you know, Docker will call, you know, containers, uh, deploy your containers, you know, in your infrastructure, you can uh, specify, you know, which instances are probably more likely to host your, your uh, application in terms of, you know, this instance has an SSD drive or has a great, you know, network connectivity and so forth. So I'm not going into too much in detail, but what is the big deal here? So you can use one orchestration framework. That's a huge point right here. You can use locally the same recipes that you will use when you deploy to production. And if you get nothing else out of that talk, remember this. Because I see a lot of people, you know, locally, they will fire off things by hand, they will brainstorm stuff around, and then try to kind of like piecemeal the applications local. And then comes, you know, uh, D-Day, the production day, and it's like, uh, you know, sky is falling, reverse gravity. Wouldn't it be really cool if you can write your deployment recipes along with your code, versions, you know, all those recipes along with it, share it with your teammates, and then, you know, come be they it's exactly the same stuff except bigger. You're going to have more instances of your database, more instances of your service, but everything is the same and you can run everything here today locally, uh, and I'll show you how in a second. Uh, so you have a built-in DNS, you can name things that make sense, you can link containers like you see, you know, with Docker Compose, you know, if you guys are familiar with that. And you can hold your own deployment, you can manage it as code, as a live thing, which I think is awesome. So in essence, you really a mini instance of what you will have, you know, in production come D-Day, right, and you can do that from the get-go. Uh, you can do your own uh, local cloud, cloud management, so give, they have a, a really great command line interface that you can use, and you can switch context, and then basically be locally here and manage your AWS cloud or DigitalOcean cloud with exactly the same commands that you would have used here locally on your own machine. A uh, very cool dashboard showing you, you know, what everything is running, what kind of versions are running, and, and so forth. Uh, you can scale your instances, so you can, you know, if, I, I think there was a, uh, um, you know, PG2 talk this morning and people were asking about, well, great, you know, I've got several instances of Phoenix, how do I hook everything together? I've got uh, this guy here, look at it. So is Discovery API, we've been, that's been on topic, so let's, uh, let's look at that too. Are you kidding? Uh, okay, there's much more. I've got a Slack control application. Uh, yeah, I've been here all week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, thanks guys for uh, getting me an HDMI cable. Um, so my name's Aaron Renner, I'm a software engineer at Telnex. We're a VoIP uh, service provider, uh, and we run in a microservices environment, uh, which has allowed us to put uh, about three Elixir apps into production. Um, this is just a, a simple, a uh, stripped down version of our microservices uh, that we have set up. And the part I'm specifically working on is number porting, so transferring numbers from carrier to carrier. Uh, when you get in the microservices environment, there's a lot of uh, interdependencies, services calling other services. So I'm, I just want to talk about how, to, how we test the interaction between um, the number porting service and then the number details service, which says this phone number is uh, based in Orlando, Colorado, uh, Orlando, Florida. I'm from Colorado. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's a portability check endpoint. You give it a phone number, uh, and then it goes and looks up the location at that external service. Um, checks our database, see if we have coverage in that location, and then says yes or no on if we have service. 
uh, if we can port that number. The, if, so I write an API client uh, that's pretty straightforward to call an external service and to test it, you use something like bypass to make sure, uh, or to fake the server response, make the call, and assert that uh, it's deserialized correctly. Um, but what about with integration tests? Say you're going to write a controller test uh, and for this endpoint, and it crawls all the way down uh, the stack. Well, you don't want it necessarily hitting that, um, relying on that number detail service uh, to make your test pass. So, um, in Ruby, what I would do is I go reach for mocks. Um, you can do this, and you could do something like this in Elixir again with bypass or uh, the mock library. Um, but then everywhere that you have code that touches uh, or that uh, ends up making this call all the way through, you got to insert those mock statements and that's kind of a pain. Another alternative is to build a test version uh, um, of the number detail service uh, where you give it a uh, already known number and it returns a canned response. So I was trying to figure out what to do. And I ran across this quote from Jose, where he, he said, uh, instead of actually mocking your existing adapter, um, instead create a, uh, create a mock that's a noun, um, create a mock object that implements that API. So that kind of gave me an idea, OK, let's go in this, in this direction of building a test version of the number detail service. Okay, um, so now I have two adapters. I have the HTTP adapter that goes and gets the, or makes the request uh, to the actual number detail service, and I have a test adapter. I have uh, some predefined responses, like for this Orlando number, this is the Orlando McDonald's, if anyone's looking for dinner. Uh, and then I go ahead and set, set up my default adapter and config.exs, and then my test adapter and test.exs. Um, then to go ahead and grab the current adapter, you go into the uh, application.getend and call it. Uh, that gives you back the current adapter instance and you call lookup on it. Um, now our integration test is a lot simpler. We can just say, here's the Orlando number uh, and we know it'll call all the way through to our test adapter and we're good. We don't have to put any mocking or anything in here. So, but now we have two adapters, uh, we have, and we need to keep those in sync. We don't want things to pass with our test adapter, but when we get to production, things don't work. So a couple ways to keep them in sync. First of all, if you use structs as your return values, then the compiler does checks. So if you call things, if you call a phone number uh, test and just number uh, in, your, in your production HTTP adapter, uh, this, this will catch those issues. Also, you can, uh, to keep the adapters in sync, you can use behaviors. So each adapter is expected to implement these methods with these return types. This is checked by the compiler, uh, and you can also use um, dialyzer for even further checking. Um, I also really didn't like spreading around this application.getend throughout my app. I didn't want anyone to have to know that we're switching adapters. Uh, so I wrapped, I created a proxy module that basically just passes those calls through to the current adapter. That way down here at the bottom, you can see um, the, yeah, we just call number details.lookup and uh, proxies all the way through. Thanks for your time. Here's a link and I uh, appreciate it. All right, testing. All right, cool. I need the, this type of mic because I have to live code. Ugh. All right, so um, this is my first talk. This is my li first library. I'm super nervous, but um, imagining all of you in your underwear is a super bad idea, so I'm not going to try it. Now, one of the reasons I really like Elixir, like really fell in love with it, is because it's lispy. It allows me to, at some point, write intent more so than I'm writing code, which is really awesome. And so at some point I was making some web app and I was trying my darn hardest to get a basic WebSockets API. I just wanted to be able to make a single page application, it would work in like Angular or React, and it would just ask the server for stuff, get information back, and communicate back and forth. I didn't need views, I didn't need models, I didn't need a bunch of complicated stuff. And so I know that I could use like Phoenix, but like, ain't nobody got time for that. So what I wanted to do is get with it and just make 
WebSocket APIs and worry about what was happening in the server after the fact. So I made this library for myself, and I decided, hey, why not put this on GitHub and see if people tend to like it. And so what this is is very simple. It, you just import it. So I'm going to kind of demonstrate this for you today and get you set up. Now, I kind of forgot that my windows would move around when I uh, plugged it in, but I can't really avoid that. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how simple it is to get a um, WebSocket thing working on Elixir just using a library that relies heavily on macros. So we start in the mix file. Basically, we just have two imports. We have Cowboy, because everybody needs Cowboy in their life. And we have Socks, which is my library. Then you got, um, it's super simple. You just go to main, and you have the standard Cowboy way of doing things. And this is where you would put like dependencies and index and whatever. But right now, we're going to focus on slash real time, and we're going to upgrade that to a WebSocket and use socks.handle. Now, in socks, we have a config, and basically we set an endpoint, which is a module that we are kind of going to. I kind of ripped off the whole endpoint nomenclature from Chris. Don't worry about it. Um, and then we have a set protocol. So let's try it out, and hopefully it won't crash, but, you know. So I'm going to run IEX. Okay, so far so good. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to basically have, uh, I probably should make this bigger for you guys. What I'm going to do is I'm going to clear those and just basically start a WebSocket connection. And so I'm connected. So now what this is going to do is it's going to send that WebSocket connection to this module. And what I'm doing is I'm using socks.wall. And essentially, I have these macros, like get. So if I say get do nothing, let's try that. Do nothing. OK, nothing has been accomplished. And basically, it's just returning some calculation or doing something. But maybe I want to set state and remember and add to state. So this will, through the macros, add to state. So let's set thing to pi. OK, done. And so what it did was it took what? It pattern matched and took all of this and considered it into the actual outputted code. And that's emitted into Beam and it's being run. And so it returns, OK, done. But then here, it updates the state with this thing equals what? So now, if I want to get that thing, I simply get and then I put a thing, get the thingy, and you know, return that would be thing. So I say, you know, get the thing, and that would be pi. And just so that you know I'm not talking crap, I'm going to try it with something different, and that would be cake. So it is actively modifying the state. It's, it's uh, merging it automatically. It's checking for all of the inconsistencies and whatever, and fails graciously. Not only that, but if I don't do a correct um, command, um, it actually has global um, fault tolerance. So it will essentially complain at you. Now in the config, you also can uh, get around that by setting a global um, fallback, which won't uh, blame you when you F up. So now I'm going to show you something really cool, which is where I personally like to use this, is you can essentially have a third argument that you return. Oh, man, really? Oh. Would you be agreeable to letting me finish? All right. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate it.